Hey there, welcome to Sweet Home Evangelical Church. I'm Pastor Brian here. Thanks so much for joining me. Hope you're having a great day today. Uh, we're going we're gonna to be in the book of Genesis today, but today is a national holiday. It's Super Bowl Sunday. It's, it's not as big as Christmas, but it's almost as big as Thanksgiving, I think. And it's, uh, it's the big holiday here now. I, I, don't, I still don't quite know who to root for in this game. Uh, I don't know. I'm not a fan of the Rams too much. But then again, I know, I know that there's some of you who are cheering for the Cincinnati Bengals just because they wear the same colors as the Oregon State Beavers. And so, you know, who knows what's going to happen here. However, you know, there, and, and there's been all this hype for Super Bowl for a couple weeks. Uh, they're starting pre-game uh, stuff and, and there's all the pre-game activities and stuff on TV and all that. And then they'll play the game and then after the game there's the post-game wrap-up and they do this a lot of times with football games and sometimes with basketball games and things. Uh, there's the post-game show. And, and they just kind of go over, here's some highlights, and here's, here's how you know, the game turned out, and then looking ahead on what's going to happen next, game, you know, f- next for everybody here. And that's kind of what we're doing today. We, we've been in a series in the book of Genesis. We're actually finishing up a seven-part series in, in Joseph here in the book of Genesis, but like I say, you know, I, I, I don't know if you really know this, but I've been in a series in the book of Genesis for several years. I've just broken it up over, over quite a while. Uh, back in January of 2015, I did a, a series in Genesis. I called it Mythbusters Genesis Edition. And we looked at, you know, God creating the earth and, and God creating men and women and why and how that fits together and, and sin and Tower of Babel. And so we have different languages and races and things like that. And, and just kind of looked at the beginning things. And then a couple years later, we did a series on Abraham. And then a couple more years later, we did a series on uh, Abraham's sons, uh, Isaac, I, his son Isaac, and then Isaac's son Jacob. And so, you know, here we are finishing up the book of Genesis that I've been in for what, what like seven years here. And today, we're, we're not just wrapping up this series in Joseph, but we're wrapping up the entire book of Genesis. And, <laughs> and, and the family is moved down to Egypt, and we're kind of wrapping that up. And this totally sets us up for the next set of stories coming in the book of Exodus. And so it, it's almost kind of like TV shows do where this is the cliffhanger at the end of season four, kind of leaving you hanging for what's going to happen in season five. And uh, so maybe in a couple of years we'll start a series in, in Exodus or something. But we're starting, we're doing something a little different starting next Sunday, but today we're wrapping up uh, the book of Genesis. I love the Old Testament stories, love preaching from the Old Testament stories. And sometimes I really, I'm not quite sure where it's going to go when I plan out, hey, here's what we're doing. But the past few weeks have been so incredibly relevant for where we are in this day and age where we're at. I, we, we've been looking at Joseph, but we looked at how does a godly person live in an ungodly world? Uh, we looked at how to process your guilt and shame from things that happened maybe even 20 years ago. Uh, last week we looked at how to launch into the unknown future, which is incredibly important for us as the future really we aren't quite sure where, what's going to happen. And so today as we close up this series uh, this year, and actually this whole series in the book of Genesis, we're, we're kind of doing the post-game show, and uh, it, it's not falling together nicely in a nice little package. Today is almost like four different sermons today. And so, you know, hang on with me, okay? 
They won't be long sermons, but there are four different sections here. And the first sermon, number one, is Joseph's dad, Jacob. Jacob shows us how to finish strong. Jacob shows us how to finish strong. Uh, we got the big football game today. And one of, one of those things in sports is you have to play the entire game. Uh, we see this in the Olympics, too, going on right now. And, and you got to play all four quarters because there's no prize for being ahead at halftime. There's no prize for being ahead at the end of the third quarter. Uh, we, and, and for those of you who watch sports, you've seen plenty of games where a team was ahead at the end of the third quarter, and then they just coasted, and they didn't play the whole game, and they ended up losing. And that's how life works. <sighs> You can do fairly well the first three quarters of your life, but if you don't finish strong, you could lose everything. And, and Jacob shows us how to finish strong. See, we're at the end of the book of Genesis, but this is the end of Jacob's life. And, and Jacob is a blessing to others. He blesses the leader of the nation. He blesses his children. He blesses his grandchildren. Jacob is the grandson of Abraham, major character in the book of Genesis. Abraham and Sarah, they had to wait for a long time before they had kids, finally had Isaac. Isaac and his wife, Rebekah, they had to wait for quite a while before they had kids. And they had twin boys, Esau and Jacob. And they kind of played favorites with the kids. Isaac. He, he played favorites. He liked Esau. Esau was the oldest one by a few minutes because they're twins. And, but Isaac's wife, Rebecca, she favored Jacob. And, well, you know, there's this whole deal about how Isaac uh, is getting ready to give a blessing to his children. And Jacob had tricked his brother out of uh, the birthright uh, by giving, you know, and Esau was dumb enough to sell his birthright for a bowl of soup, uh, and Jacob was ornery enough to, to make that bargain. But here we are, Isaac is getting towards the end of his life, and he wants to give out the oldest son birthright blessing here. And he sends Esau to go out, go hunting. You know, you need to go hunting and get me something and make it and, br and bring it in and, and we'll eat it and then uh, I'll give you the blessing. And while Esau is doing that, Isaac's wife, Rebecca, and their son, Jacob, they trick Isaac into giving the blessing to Jacob. There are shenanigans along the way and Isaac is the trickster. He tricked his father into receiving the blessing. Well, Isaac's, uh, Jacob's brother Esau is mad, and so Jacob leaves. He goes back east. He wants to marry Rachel. She's so pretty, and he just wants to marry her. And what goes around comes around. Jacob's father-in-law tricks Jacob. He does the old switcheroo on the wedding night and uh, switched daughters there. And Jacob was marrying uh, Rachel. That's what the wedding invitation said. But on the wedding night, father-in-law switched brides. He wakes up the next morning, finds out, wait a minute, he married the sister Leah, and now he has to work seven more years to marry Rachel. Jacob was tricked. And, uh, and then Jacob, though, he, he has two wives now, plus those wives, they have, they have maids. And it gets a little dicey here because in the scripture, it, you know, it's, it's the words that's used and then there's the way it's translated. And some places it says that these were maids. Some places it says handmaids. Some places these two, you know, his two wives, they had their maid, but 
Jacob also had relations with them. Some places they're called his concubines. Some places they're called his wives. And so it's all this one big dysfunctional sister-wife situation here. Yet along the way, Jacob, he meets with God. Jacob has a meeting with God at a place that Jacob renames and calls it Bethel, which means house of God. There's a famous passage in Genesis chapter 32 where Jacob meets God. There is this God shows up in sort of in human form, and it talks about how Jacob wrestled with God. And Jacob is losing this wrestling match, but he will not give up. He will not let go. He will not let go until you bless me. Jacob's always fighting for a blessing. He tricked his dad into a blessing. He's fighting with God for a blessing. Jacob was all about receiving a blessing. That was important to him. A few months ago, I did a funeral for Don Emmert. Wonderful, wonderful man. I had saved his Bible and was able to use his Bible for the service. And uh, I, uh, Don had a marker uh, right in the Bible in Psalm 103, and so that's what I preached from for Don's service. And it, and it says in Psalm 103, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. And then Don wrote in the margin, uh, Bless, it means to honor exalt and glorify that was an easy funeral for me to do because don already got me started you know earlier in his life jacob was all about receiving blessings he was trying to get as much honor and respect and exaltation as he could but now in the later chapters of Genesis, Jacob is finishing strong. He's about giving blessings. He's about praying God's blessings over others. Uh, Jacob blesses Pharaoh. Pharaoh just means the king of Egypt. It says in Genesis 47, verse 7, Then Joseph brought his father Jacob and presented him to Pharaoh, and Jacob blessed Pharaoh. How old are you? Pharaoh asked him. Jacob replied, I have traveled this earth for 130 hard years, but my life has been short compared to the lives of my ancestors. Then Jacob blessed Pharaoh again before leaving his court. Um, Jacob was blessing the king. Jacob and the king probably weren't part of the same political party, uh, yet Jacob was blessing the leader of the nation. And that's, pro that's a good reminder for us as it's oh, so politics is so divisive in our world these days and it infects everything. It's infected the church like crazy. And there's like, you know, this president and then the previous president and you got governors and everything and, and people like this one and not that one or that one and not this one or whatever. And yet, as God's people, we need to step back a little bit and pray God's blessing over them, whether we like them or not. Uh, Paul talks about this in, in 1 Timothy 2, where he says, I urge you, first of all, to pray for all people, ask God to help them, intercede on their behalf, give thanks for them, pray this way for kings and all who are in authority, not because you like them, it says, so that we can live peaceful and quiet lives marked by godliness and dignity. That's the goal, is to live a peaceful, quiet life. And so we pray for those in, in authority. Jacob blessed, he prayed God's blessing over the king of Egypt. And Egypt, they didn't know anything about God, didn't care. All they knew about God was from Jacob and Joseph. And that's not all that different than the world we live in. And, and we're praying God's blessings over people. Jacob also blesses his grandchildren. In, Gen in the next chapter, Genesis 48, uh, Jacob is getting towards the end of his life. He was 130 when he came to Egypt. Now we're getting towards the end of his life. And Jacob is half blind, kind of like his dad, Isaac. And Joseph brings his two boys, Manasseh and Ephraim, to Grandpa Jacob. Kind of a flashback to when Jacob was young and tricking his father out of the blessing. 
And as is typical with this family, he gives the greater blessing to the younger brother, which bothers me because I'm the older brother in my family, and so it just doesn't feel right. But in this blessing, it's not magic words that he's saying, not some incantation or something. He is praying for Joseph's sons. He's praying for Manasseh and Ephraim. And in, in Genesis 48, it says in verse 15, Then Jacob blessed Joseph and said, May the God before whom my grandfather Abraham and my father Isaac walked, the God who has been my shepherd all my life to this very day, the angel to whom has, he has redeemed me from all harm, may he bless these boys. May they preserve my name and the names of Abraham and Isaac, and may their descendants multiply greatly throughout the earth. He, in here later on, J J Jacob has a greater blessing for his grandson Ephraim, uh, even though he's the younger brother of Manasseh, uh, and, and that eventually, eventually Ephraim did become the greater tribe. Uh, one of the uh, descendants of Ephraim was Joshua, Joshua who led the Israelites back into the promised land. In the next chapter, in chapter 49, we see how Jacob blessed his family. And, and you know, his, uh, he has all this, these blessings for each of his 12 sons. And Jacob blessed his family. And his last wish in chapter 49 was to follow in faith, this faith of his father and grandfather, uh, the, the faith of Abraham and Isaac. And it says in Genesis 49, verse 29, <clears throat> Then Jacob instructed his sons, Soon I will die and join my ancestors. Bury me with my father and grandfather in the cave in the field of Ephron the Hittite. This is the cave in the field of this guy near Mamre in Canaan. It's in this town of Hebron uh, that Abraham bought from Ephraim the Hittite as a permanent burial site. There Abraham and his wife Sarah are buried. There Isaac and his wife Rebekah are buried. There I bury Leah. It is the plot of land in the cave that my grandfather Abraham bought. When Jacob had finished his charge to his sons, he drew his feet into his bed, breathed his last, and joined his ancestors in death. At the, in chapter 50, it tells how the family did take Jacob's body back to the promised land. They buried him with Abraham and Isaac. There is a church there in, in Hebron, in Israel. I didn't get to go there when I was in Israel, but a friend of mine, on his trip to Israel, they went there, and he said it was amazing <laughs> that Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are buried there, the, the church of the patriarchs. Jacob wanted to be sure that he finished strong and followed the ways of his father and grandfather. And that's why there is a phrase that is used over and over in the scriptures. It... it describes God as the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Jacob shows us how to finish strong, and then we move on to sermon number two, the brothers. The brothers show us that sometimes we struggle with forgiveness. Sometimes we have this question, am I really forgiven? That's a big question that we all have sometimes. These brothers of Joseph, they were very imperfect guys. They were not godly people like Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. We talked about them a couple weeks ago. They, they wanted to kill Joseph. They decided to sell little brother off into slavery because they could make a, a few pieces of silver. And so, you know, not only that, but there were other issues, especially with the older boys in chapter 49, where Jacob blesses all of his sons. It says in, in Genesis 49, verse 2, Come and listen, you sons of Jacob. Listen to Israel, your father. Reuben, you are my firstborn. 
my strength, the child of my vigorous youth. You're first in rank, first in power, but you are as unruly as a flood, and you will be first no longer. For you went to bed with my wife, you defiled my marriage couch. Simeon and Levi are two of a kind. Their weapons are instruments of violence. May I never join in their meetings, and may I never be party to their plans. For in their anger they murdered men, and they crippled oxen just for sport. Okay. Reuben, the oldest, the son of Leah. Uh, But Reuben had relations with one of his dad's concubines, one of these maids of, I can't remember if it was Leah's maid or Rachel's maid, but that's that's just kind of messed up, okay? That ain't right. And so, hey, you're out. You're not the firstborn. You, You don't get the firstborn blessing here. And then he talks about Simeon and Levi, sons number two and three out of the 12 boys, these two guys avenged their sister's honor. There's uh, back in, oh, I can't remember. I think it's chapter 34. Uh, it talks about how their sister Dinah was a victim of sexual assault. And these two boys, they went and got some good old-fashioned Texas justice. The problem is, you know, they didn't just kill the guy that assaulted their sister, they killed every guy in that town. And they, they went way too far. And so, you know, Jacob leaves them out too. And then we get to son number four, and he wasn't perfect. He had his problems. I think in chapter 38, we see his issues. Yet, Judah did redeem himself when we had this whole episode of uh, Benjamin being accused. He was falsely accused, planted evidence, but Judah stood up for Benjamin and he said, no, he's not going into, he's not taking the fall. I will take the fall for this. Sell me off into slavery, not the kid. And so Jacob makes Judah the leader. It says in chapter 49, verse 8, Judah, your brothers will praise you. You will grasp your enemies by the neck. All your relatives will bow before you. Judah, my son, is a young lion that has finished eating its prey like a lion crouches and lies down like a lioness who dares to rouse him. The scepter will not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from his descendants until the coming of the one to whom it belongs, the one to whom all nations will honor. That's amazing, isn't it? We're looking ahead to Jesus. Judah was the leader. Uh, When Moses led the Israelites out of Egypt, and and there's all these just detailed explanations in Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Uh, they, they arranged the tribes. They traveled in groups, and the tribe of Judah was always on, on the lead of, of whenever they traveled. Judah was always leading. This also hints at King David, who would come from the tribe of Judah and his descendants, who were the rulers in Jerusalem. And it also points to Jesus, our eternal king. It says Judah is a lion. At the end of the Bible, in the book of Revelation, it talks about how Jesus being the lion of Judah. It says in in Revelation, Behold the lion of the tribe of Judah. The heir to David's throne has won the victory. But after Jacob passed away, though, you know, Jacob has these, these words for his sons, but after he passed away, And we have his funeral there back in the promised land, back in chapter 50. It says in Genesis 50, verse 15, But now that their father was dead, Joseph's brothers became fearful. Now Joseph will show his anger and pay us back for all the wrong we did to him, they said. It's now 17 years later. Uh, It's been about 40 years since they sold little brother into slavery. You know, Joseph forgave them 17 years ago, but they are still 
nervous. They're struggling with the question a lot of people struggle with, am I really forgiven? Did God really forgive me? Are you sure? Did he really mean it? And lots of people wonder if God has forgiven them. And the problem is that our frame of reference for forgiveness is the way we forgive others. And that's and that's an imperfect forgiveness that we have. For many people, it's just temporary, isn't it? They say they forgive, but they haven't really forgiven. They take it back, but when God forgives us, when God forgives us, it is done. When God has forgiven you, when you've truly repented of your sins, and you've received forgiveness from God, it is done. It says in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 18, And when sins have been forgiven, there is no need to offer any more sacrifices. So if you're like the brothers and you're worried if God has really forgiven you, if you truly believe in God, you place your faith and trust in him, you have been forgiven. It's not temporary. You don't need to be like these brothers and wonder if you've done enough to keep God happy, like they wondered if they'd done enough to keep Joseph happy. Jesus already paid for your sin. You just need to receive it, accept it, and live it. Number three, I need to keep moving here. Number three, Joseph is the example of how to live as a godly minority. Joseph spent a long time as a godly minority in Egypt. His brothers weren't really following God uh, like their father and grandfather Uh, Joseph is a bit like Jesus, like it says in in the Gospel of John, he came to his own and his own received him not. Yeah, just like Jesus, Joseph was sold for a few pieces of silver. He's falsely accused, he suffers, yet in the end, he brings salvation for the entire family. And not only that, Joseph brought salvation for all the people of Egypt. This kind of foreshadows what Jesus did. Uh, How... Jesus' work on the cross was for the children of Israel and for everyone. God so loved the world. After Joseph put his brothers through a bit of a process of restoration, he was quick to forgive them. He pointed out that God had a reason and a purpose for this. In chapter 47, it says Jacob was 130 years old when he came to Egypt and that he died at the age of 147. So here we are, it's 17 years later, we got the funeral, they took him back to the family cemetery, uh, back in the promised land in Hebron. Yet the family is still staying in Egypt. They're not moving back there. The brothers, though they're afraid that now that dad is gone, maybe Joseph's gonna get some good old fashioned Texas justice on them for what they did to him 40 years earlier. But it says in Genesis chapter 50, verse 19, but Joseph replied, don't be afraid of me. Am I God that I can punish you? You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good. And Joseph has said this a few times along the way. Guys, I know, you know, and I know what you did was wrong. You intended to harm me, but God worked good out of it. God was in it. God intended it for good. And Joseph also said, now, you know, don't be afraid. And, and he re- reassured them. And, um, and yet Joseph was looking forward to the promised land. Somewhere along the way, things changed from Joseph being a favorite of Pharaoh and running the country And by the time Moses comes along a few hundred years later, they're all slaves in Egypt. And I think it was already changing a bit during the lifetime of Joseph. It says that Joseph lived to be 110 years old, which that's 80 years since he did the interpreting of dreams for Pharaoh and all of that and gets, you know, put in charge of running the country. So it's here we are 80 years later. A lot has changed. And it sounds like returning to Canaan isn't quite really an option at this point. And they're almost starting on this path to slavery. There's at least some travel restrictions. It says in Genesis 50, verse 24. 
Joseph says, soon I will die, Joseph told his brothers. Probably brothers had passed away, so it's more like nephews and grandnephews. But God will surely come and help you and lead you out of this land of Egypt. He will bring you back to the land he solemnly promised to give to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. And then Joseph made the sons of Israel swear an oath, and he said, uh, when God comes to help you and lead you back, you must take my bones with you. So Joseph died at the age of 110. Joseph lived for the Lord, and he looked to the Lord all the time. During his time in slavery, his time in prison, it says over and over again that God was with Joseph. And Joseph lived that. And here in chapter 50, he says, you know, and, and it sounds like things aren't all that great for the family, but he says, hey, it's okay. God will surely come and help you and bring you out of Egypt. They weren't living large and in charge anymore. Things had churned, but Joseph knows how that goes. I love this passage, how Joseph tells them, makes him promise to take his bones with them uh, back to the promised land. And uh, I preached a couple funerals on this passage, how, and, and they did. I mean, Joseph passed away a few hundred later, years later, oh, 300 and some years later, uh, for almost 400 years after Joseph passed away. Moses leads the children of Israel out of Egypt, and it says in Exodus 13, they took Joseph's bones with them. And then they wandered in the wilderness for 40 years, and finally they entered the promised land. And so here we are, it's almost 400 years between the death and the funeral, but eventually it happened. It says that, that Joshua, uh, the uh, descendant of Ephraim, the son of Joseph, uh, took uh, Joseph and buried him there in the promised land. Joseph was a godly minority. He was always looking to the Lord, and, he's always, and he was looking to being in the promised land. And that's a good example for us, too, is, is our focus is on being in the promised land. Jacob shows us how to finish strong. The brothers show us sometimes we wrestle with the assurance of forgiveness. Joseph shows us how do we live looking to the Lord our entire lives, and then the last sermon here, God shows his faithfulness. God was faithful all along the way. It says in chapter 39, three times that God was with Joseph uh, when he was uh, in slavery, when he was in prison. God was with him when he interpreted dreams for people in prison. God was with him when he was brought in in front of the king of Egypt. And the king said, hey, I hear you interpret dreams. I got some for you. And Joseph said, I can't do this, but God can. We also learn about God's timing. God is faithful. God is much more patient than I am. He's more patient than we are. God is willing to allow us to go through difficult times until the right time. Uh, God was with Joseph during these difficult times. And, and, and it, was, it was just waiting for the right time. Our circumstances are a really bad indicator of whether or not we are in God's will. Joseph was in slavery. He was in prison. Uh, yet, all along the way, he was in God's will. God was with him, and God was faithful. Joseph may have not felt like Everything was going according to plan. But Joseph just didn't know the rest of the story yet. Part of the story was about building the nation of Israel, and that was something that needed to happen in Egypt. If they would have stayed there in Canaan, they probably would have done like our girls have done. Uh, they would have married uh, people from this country and intermarried with them and just settled and stayed there. And, um, but in Egypt, they were pretty segregated. And they became the nation of Israel while they were in Egypt. God's timing is always the right timing. And even when it's uncomfortable, 
that didn't mean that God had forgotten about them. God never forgot about his people. It says uh, in, in Exodus, uh, in the next book, kind of you know, this preview uh, for the next series uh, coming up in a couple of years, but in Exodus chapter 2, verse 24, it says, God heard their groaning, and he remembered his covenant promise to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. But that's kind of the teaser for the next series coming up. God, God is faithful. And just because things aren't working out the way we had planned, that doesn't mean it's not working out the way God has planned. As long as we look to him, God will be with us and God is faithful to us. We look at people like Jacob who finished strong, even though life had its ups and downs, he finished strong. He was try doing everything he could to get blessings during his life. But at the end of life, he was busy blessing others. The brothers, they struggled with, am I really forgiven? Joseph, he was God's man. He is our example of what it means to be God's person. Forgiving others, even though they hurt you deeply, living for God is a godly minority in an ungodly world. And so somewhere in there, God is speaking to you, and God is calling you to, be, uh, to finish strong, to know that you're forgiven, to be this godly minority in an ungodly world, and to keep following him. And God is faithful. Let me pray for you. Lord God, we come before you today. Lord, we thank you that you are faithful to us. Lord, I pray you bless each one watching, listening right now. Oh, I know there's not a lot of people still watching right now, but Lord, you know them. You know everything about them. Pray that your grace would surround them. You draw them into you. Even though you feel like, you know, t life isn't working out perfectly, Lord, help us to look to you and realize we don't know the end of the story yet. Lord, we trust in you, we thank you, we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, Lord bless you. Thanks for joining me. Have a great week. We'll talk to you later. Bye-bye.